So welcome to the lecture forum um, featuring Maria Teresa Dangilan Vitug. Yeah. Um, we actually invited Marites a long, long time ago, and we had um, book launching for um, Tama, Shadow of Doubt? Dito. Dito, sa auditorium sa taas. Okay. Um, it was, I think, a Saturday. And when I was introducing her that time, ang naalala ko, okay, um, that at that time she was, um, she was fighting two libel suits filed by um, then Justice um, Presbytero Velasco at that time. Um, apparently, he withdrew the, 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 the cases. Okay. So Marites is associated now with Rappler. Okay. Um, she has won a number of awards, including the Philippine National Book Award in Journalism for her pioneering book, Power from the Forest, The Politics of Logging, and Under the Crescent Moon, Rebellion in Mindanao with Glenda Gloria. She was given the Courage in Journalism Award by the US-based International Women's Media Foundation for her exposés on the plunder of Palawan Forest. She's also the author with Griselda Yabes of anata? Jalan Jalan? Yes. Jalan Jalan, A Journey Through Ayaga. Asia Week chose, chose the book as one of the best books on Asia in 1999. She heads the Journalism for Na Nation Building Foundation, a spin-off of um, Newsbreak. The foundation will, will continue to do public interest journalism, mainly through books and special reports. Now she is with Rappler. Okay, um, friends, Marites Vito. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Thank you very much, Ali, for or helping me come to Baguio and to the UP College of Social Sciences for making this event possible. It's actually truly nice to be back. I was once a student here in a, during a summer course, and that must have been in the early 70s, so you can date me. When I took one or two subjects here, and I remember, of course, it, UP was different than UP Baguio. I don't remember this building. And I took uh, one subject under Ray, Professor Ray Casambre, natural science, not sci. He was teaching a natural science course. And it was called and was not sci. And I just learned he was arrested last night, uh, he and his wife. So apparently they're now in Camp Krame. Uh, as we know, he was an activist and a consultant of the peace talks uh, on the side of the NDF. Anyway, actually studying here was an excuse for me to spend time in Baguio, uh, of course, with your allure of cold temperature. Now, uh, let's, let me begin this talk in 2016. There, the events that took place two years ago. So on the evening of July 12, 2016, journalists gathered in the press room of the Department of Foreign Affairs, waiting for then Foreign Secretary Perfecto Yasai to give the first official reaction of the Philippines to its sweeping victory in The Hague. A couple of hours earlier, the Permanent Court of Arbitration had announced the tribunal's decision. They released a 500-page award, as it was called, called on its website. So in the room, the reporters told me that you know, the air was heavy with anticipation, and there was a hushed silence on the room as Yasai stood before the podium to read a prepared statement. And this was going to be aired live on national TV. So we can, when he came into the room, uh, the reporters were surprised that he, was, he appeared sad, morose, with no trace of a smile on his face. And then he read a very short statement, part of it is on the slide, and he said, the Philippines welcomes the issuance today of the award by the arbitral tribunal. Our experts are studying the award with care and thoroughness that this significant outcome deserves. In the meantime, we call on all those concerned 
to exercise restraint and sobriety. The Philippines strongly affirms its respect for this milestone decision as an important contribution to ongoing efforts in addressing disputes in the South China Sea. And the Philippines reiterates its abiding commitment to efforts to pursue the peaceful resolution and management of disputes to promote and enhancing peace in the region. So with his deliberate manner, Yasai took up three minutes to read the four paragraph statement and then he hurriedly re left the room. So the, the reporters and people watching were surprised that a landmark decision that garnered accolades from international legal circles and allies of the Philippines was given such a lackluster response. In fact, there was a columnist for the website CNBC who wrote, and I quote, without any other context, you might have thought Yasai was delivering a eulogy. So in his home, Rene, Jose Rene Almendras, who was foreign secretary in the last few months of the Aquino government, watched Yasai on TV. So he was also surprised that there was no sense of joy or a whiff of elation. Yet this was the culmination of the first ever international arbitration case on the South China Sea that gave the Philippines its shining moment. Uh, in the DFA under Almendras, it was a short term, they already had a victory scenario. They thought that maybe if the ruling came out before uh, Pinoy stepped down, they were supposed to issue a statement that would reflect the significant gains of the Philippines, celebrate the rule of law, and call for international support for compliance with the ruling because there was no and there is no global policeman to enforce it. His predecessor, Albert Del Rosario, under whose watch the arbit arbitration case was filed, had already talked with representatives of various governments for statements of support if the Philippines won. And they were ex these countries were expected to follow after the Philippines released its own statement. So uh, the scenario was the Philippines would release a statement celebrating the rule of law and calling for support. And then the, uh, the allies, uh, Europe, US, uh, Japan, Australia, would then release individual statements. But none of this never ha ever happened because the award was issued after Aquino stepped down. This did not stop, however, hundreds of people who gathered and celebrated, released balloons and tossed flowers in the air. Uh, this was before the ruling was released. And when the news on the victory spread, hashtag Chexit, short for China Exit, rippled on Twitter. So that was Chexit was a trending uh, hashtag then at that time. And outside the Chinese embassy in Manila, uh, demonstrators waved colorful streamers. As you can see, China, respect the rights of our fishermen, hashtag Chexit, China out of PH waters. And some carried a makeshift fishing boat with a Philippine flag, flag planted on it. And of course, it says China, out of PH territory. But before proceeding with the next part of my presentation, I'll just show sh some slides that uh, will give us an idea of the place that we're talking about. So some maps and definitions. Uh, here in the Spratly Islands, this is, uh, Spratly Islands is where, is really where the contested area is. And Kalayaan Island Group is a smaller area within the Spratly Islands. And this was what Marcos declared in 1978 yeah, as part of the Philippines. And then the West Philippine Sea is a recent uh, name that we have used to call this area of the South China Sea. This was only under President Aquino. And it is smaller than the South China Sea. Of course, South China Sea is the bigger area, which covers, uh, as we can see here, hundreds of rocks, reefs, and it's a trading route which produces, which is a very rich area for uh, trading countries. 
And you can download maps of South China Sea, West Philippine Sea uh, on the internet. You can just look for the e-book of Justice Antonio Carpio. I got these maps from his e-book. They're all free. You can download them. So you can have a sense of place. And this is the Kalayaan Island Group. Uh, it is a municipality of Palawan. And Pag-asa is the closest to uh, Palau uh, Pag-asa is the closest to the mainland of Palawan. It's very difficult to go to Pag-asa. I hope eventually it will become a tourist destination. But as of now, if you're interested, you can only reach there via uh, you maybe joining the ferry of the mayor who goes there maybe occasionally or the military who fly there. But you should have a research reason maybe to join them. Uh, it's very difficult to get access. The Spratly Islands, this is the contested area. Huh? I already revealed my next slide. Anyway, so the next, present, next section of my presentation, again, uh, I will start with, uh, it has been two years since the Philippines overwhelmingly won uh, our maritime case. But after this victory, the official narrative in the Philippines has been... Uh, defeatist and uh, making us feel helpless about our victory. From day one, July 12, 2016, when the arbitral tribunal issued its decision invalidating China's nine dash line and clarifying the status of certain features in South China Sea. So all the while, our victory has not been used as a leverage in the country's dealings with China. So it's not, part, it's not part of our diplomatic arsenal. The reason is because there's been a shift in foreign policy, and in the years that President Duterte has been in office, uh, he has announced, and we are all aware of this, that there's been a pivot towards China. And at that time, uh, then Foreign Affairs Secretary Cayetano revealed in, two congressional, in a congressional hearing, there is a special committee on the West Philippines See in Congress, and the committee revealed, and he revealed during that committee hearing that the DFA, or he raised the issue of the, of the Philippines victory twice with his counterpart. This is twice in two years. So this is now the new uh, strategy or foreign policy, or the reason rather for our new foreign policy towards China. China is now our source of economic deliverance. It is rebuilding and will rebuild parts of war-torn Marawi. It will invest in the, in the government's build, build, build program. And of course, tourism is important and millions of Chinese will boost this industry. And China is also our new source of weapons. So unlike the Re European Union, China is a friend of the president because he doesn't because China doesn't comment about the drug war and human rights violations and uh, extrajudicial killings. In fact, they have donated, I think, two or three drug rehabilitation centers already. So all this rhetoric, uh, I think, weakens the Philippine position. So we are now becoming a part of the chorus of approval of China in the region, joining the likes of Cambodia and Laos. And also, I think if you go over the debts uh, of all the promises or pledges of China to the Philippines, so far there are only three projects that have been started. These are, I think, two bridges in Metro Manila and I think one in Davao. So there's a lot of pledge, there are a number of pledges from China, but if we monitor them, only a few have started. So here in my book, as a journalist, I want to present a different narrative so that we are, there's another uh, story that we can listen to. That's why I go back to the, in the book, I go back to the story of Philippines versus China, which was a case that was monitored or watched in various parts of the world. So I'd like to uh, refresh our memories and go back to this historic case. People ask me, you know, why do you, why do you, uh, why did you write this book? And I think I, 
I answered them by saying that I took a leaf from what a foreign commentator wrote soon after we won in July 2016. He said, he wrote this in foreign policy. He said, having seized, contr seized control of the narrative, Manila must hang on to it. The Philippines must tell its story and tell it often. So we must keep reminding the world that we won this case, this is, and this is significant, and these are the gains. And for us Filipinos, the victory gave our country a maritime area larger than the total land area of the Philippines. So you can imagine an area larger than our, a maritime area larger than the land area, which is rich in resources. So this is the victory that this is what the victory has given us. But why is this historic? First, it is the first to interpret the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea definition of rocks, islands, and low tide elevations. Actually, I did not know any of this until I did research for the books. And I, I said, why should I care about rocks, you know, reefs? But uh, as soon as I did my research and uh, read a lot of the materials, I realized that the UNCLOS is such a significant uh, um, treaty that the Philippines has agreed with, same with China and other countries. And it is now the law that governs the seas in various parts of the world. It is also the first case to be filed by a South China Sea claimant Against, against China. It is the first time we sued a country, and it's, it's the first case to address the scope and application of UNCLOS on protection and preservation of the environment. The Philippine lawyer said that international environmental law was still an infant when UNCLOS was negotiated. In this book, I also write about how and why Aquino decided to take China to court it wasn't an easy decision considering that China was and is a superpower. There were uh, uh, some discussion in the cabinet and more so outside where a leading lawyer, Estelito Mendoza, and also a part of the Philippine delegation to UNCLOS during the Marcos years was against uh, suing China because he said we should withdraw the case and give the new incoming president at that time, Duterte, to, to decide on this. But it might, be, it might be a little known fact that China had good relations with the Philippines, and particularly Aquino, in his first days. When he was inaugurated president in 2010, China sent him a formal invitation for a state visit, the first country to do so. And it showed how strongly China wanted to woo him uh, and continue the golden years they enjoyed with Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. So in my interview with President Aquino, he reflected on his early years as president, and he said he wanted to have very good relations with China as a superpower. If you remember, he did not send a representative of the Philippines to the Nobel Prize uh, Awards in Oslo because the award was given to a dissident from China. Imagine a Philippines, no, the Philippines known for its human rights advocacy, especially under his mother, Cory Aquino, and the son not sending a representative to the awarding of Nobel Prize to the Chinese dissident. So he was heavily criticized for that. But he said he did that because he wanted to appease China, who at that time had, uh, was about to execute or... Uh, meet the death sentence to drug mules, Filipino drug mules who were in Chinese prisons. And if you remember at that time, uh, there were Hong Kong Chinese who were hijacked on a bus and were, some of them were killed and it was caused by a, it was handled badly under Aquino. So he wanted to make up. So this was the, the atmosphere then. But things changed because in, in 2011, China stopped Philippine survey ships in Reed Bank or Recto Bank. Uh, they had last, less than two weeks to go b before they could finish their survey. But China intimidated them and they stopped. And a year later in 2012, China took control of Scarborough Shoal. This was a one month and a half standoff, a very tense confrontation over fishing rights. 
Nagkaroon ng dangerous near coalitions between Philippine and Chinese ships. And much later, the tribunal ruled that China's provocations caused this. So, Aquino said that, you know, after these major incidents, he's, he remembered that one senior ASEAN leader told him, he said, there are big countries and there are small countries, and that's the way of the world. And he, has, he, he really thought about this, and he said it was precisely the law that would serve as the great equalizer. So that was his motivation, his anchor in pursuing a case versus China. And he did not want to make this decision alone, so he consulted past presidents, namely Ramos and Estrada, leaders of Congress and uh, members of the cabinet. At that time, Arroyo was, in, was under hospital arrest. So in January 2013, the Philippines began its legal battle. Here I downloaded our memorial, which is an explanation of our case, which reached more than 3,000 pages. If, if you're, after reading, I didn't read all 3,000 pages, but if you read the main memorial and the relevant annexes, I was so impressed with the Philippine government and our lawyers for being able to do Massive research in history, international law, geology, hydrography, marine biodiversity, and cartography. We submitted more than 100 maps to strengthen our case against China. We submitted volumes of uh, annexes which contained experts' reports, witnesses affidavits, historical records, official communications. This for me was most fascinating when I saw written exchanges between the Philippines and China, including notes verbal, starting from the mid-1990s. For the first time, these were made public. Intelligence reports of the Navy, the Western Command of the Armed Forces, the Department of National Defense, all these you can find in the website of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and you can see all the exchanges between Manila and Beijing and how our diplomats asserted the sovereignty of the Philippines and how the Chinese would always rebuff them saying, when Philippine diplomats would say, uh, you have violated the sovereign rights of the Philippines when you took over mischief reef, etc., etc., And the Fili Chinese would always say, China has, in quotes, indisputable sovereignty over the South China Sea. So you could see this and um, it goes back to the 1990s, officially the records that were made public. But you can also read the story, get parts of the story in the transcripts of the oral hearings held in The Hague, uh, you, which captures the essential points of the case. Oh, these were the international accolades that, some of them, which, were, which came out after July 2016. And they were really, uh, they sounded more euphoric than the Philippines. As you could see, an, a legal academic based in Switzerland, a Filipino academic based in Australia. You know, they were all singing praises to the Philippines. Closer to home, the Singaporean prime minister, who's usually very subdued, and they don't, you know, uh, they don't really aren't explicit about their feelings, even said this, the ruling of the tribunal has made a strong statement on what international law is. It's an impartial, objective way of resolving issues. Nagalit daw ang China sa Singapore after this statement. Japan uh, has been openly supporting us. Uh, this one this came from an ambassador who headed a think tank, came to Manila to speak, and he reassured the Philippines that you, you might feel lonely standing at the front line, but you are not alone. So imagine all these euphoric uh, accolades and then uh, the Philippines, how the Philippines reacted. So now what was the case all about? The Philippines wanted the court, the tribunal, to, say, to invalidate China's nine dash line. Uh, maybe if you've been listening to the lectures of Justice Carpio and other and Professor Jay Batungbakal, the experts, China has really claimed uh, a ma 
majority, the lar a large part of the South China Sea, through its nine dash lines. Ito pa lang nine dash lines, wala pa lang legal historical basis. So it was woven out of thin air by China. And our, our lawyers, led by Paul Reichler, they uh, even hired expert cartographers to help draw the maps to show that the claims of China had no basis. That's why it was Reichler who said that, you know, only, only in international tribunal can we, can the Philippines have a chance only through the rule of law. And to put issues in perspective, Justice Carpio also, you know, he, he, this is an alarming statement. He said it's the gravest threat to the Philippines since World War II. And he always said that the root cause of this dispute was the nine dash lines claim because it gobbled up large areas of the EEZs, not only of the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia. Imagine the nine dash lines, they covered 85.7% of the entire South China Sea. So he said in numbers, over 531,000 square kilometers, larger than the total land area of the Philippines of 300,000 square kilometers. That was what was at stake. And the Philippines could either keep it or lose, lose it to China. So ito na yung mga five judges who decided our case. Well, they're all men, and they hailed from different parts of the world, and they met in The Hague, where the permanent court of arbitration is. And, you know, I didn't know this, and I learned all of this during when I was doing my research. The field pala of international law of the sea is as practiced by like a hundred lawyers, and they know each other, they've heard of each other. So they know that the credibility of these five men are really beyond, the credibility is beyond reproach. Ang nangyari kasi, since China did not want to join and refused to have anything to do with the case, if China was part of the case, China would have chosen one judge, the Philippines would have chosen one judge. So we chose one judge, the German. Unfortunately, I forgot who he is among these. And uh, China didn't want to choose so ITLOS, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, had chose the Polish to represent China. Second from the right. It's interesting because he, second from the right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> second from my left. <laughs> so fourth from your right. Interesting, I pointed it out because he was in Manila recently, Judge Paulak. And I'll talk about him later. So these were the five, and uh, so the rest of the judges were picked up already by ITLOS, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. They picked up, uh, they chose one from France, from Sri Lanka, from Netherlands. The ju judge from Sri Lanka, Chris Pinto, declined. You know why? He was married to a Filipina. So he was afraid of conflict of interest situation. So when he moved, when he stepped down, he was replaced by the man in the center uh, from Ghana. He, Thomas Mensa, who chaired the tribunal. So I was told by lawyers uh, when I interviewed them, those in the law of the sea circle, that these five men are really uh, known for their expertise on law of the sea. This is Judge Palak when he visited Manila recently. It was uh, interesting because he was to, supposed to represent, well, he represented China in the tribunal. But the judges, because China wasn't there, had to prove to the public that they were not biased for the Philippines. Because how can you hear a case without another party? So what they did was they bent over backwards Ask the Philippines, Philippine lawyers to answer difficult questions that they anticipated would have been posed by China. So kaya dumami yung annexes natin kasi they ask so many questions. So sabi ni Paul Reichler when I interviewed him, it was really a lot of work which they did not expect but which the judges wanted so that to prove that they were impartial. And later, 
us. I'll show you. He gave us good advice, si Paulak. And this is where the hearing took place. It's the biggest hall in the Peace Palace in The Hague. Siyempre, empty tables. Yung isa, empty table. China should have been there. So that's Paul Reichler, I think, arguing uh, before the judges. So the Philippine delegation was huge. So they had to get the biggest hall. And observers from different countries, mainly uh, Japan, the Southeast Asian countries, but U.S. could not send an observer because hindi sila signatory to UNCLOS. So, bawal sila dyan. But the others, European allies, maraming observers. So, this was, uh, there were two sets of oral arguments. One, should the tribunal hear the case? Nasa jurisdiction ba natin to? Ito. And second, after several months when they decided, yes, this is within our jurisdiction, they had oral arguments on the merit. So we won. We all know that. But just to summarize how the judges ruled. So they said that China's claim of historic rights to resources in the waters of the South China Sea is illegal and not compatible with the EEZ ruling as provision as UNCLOS has said. So there is... They really found through the maps, they even, the judges even hired their own experts. Uh, they even ha uh, used archives from the uh, French library, and anyway, it's in my, somewhere in my book. They, they did not rely just on the Philippines and the witnesses. They had to do their own research because China uh, did not appear. So essentially, the tribunal said that China's sweeping nine dash line claim, which covered 80% of the Philippine EEZ, was illegal. And they said that none of the Spratly Islands is capable of generating extended maritime zones, and none of the features claimed by China is capable of generating an EEZ. In other words, none of the Philippines' entitlements are overlapped by any of China. So naging malinaw. The Philippines now was given the exclusive enjoyment of the resources in this area. So we won big, but there's no global policeman to enforce it. And then China, the judges said that China violated the Philippine sovereign rights because they interfer interfered with Philippine fishing and petroleum exploration. Remember Scarborough Shoal? Uh, Reed Bank, hindi lang yon. They constructed artificial islands and they stopped our fishermen from fishing in the in the area. And uh, again, in the case, it was shown that traditional fishing rights at Car Scarborough Shoal belong to not only the Philippines, pala, but Vietnam and uh, even China. They had uh, traditional fishing rights to this area, but China. Uh, drove out the Philippines and other countries. And, you know, if you, I mean, again, paulit-ulit top, uh, ref repeat refrain, maraming Chinese fishermen ang nauhuli lagi. Uh, harvest, they harvested endangered sea turtles, corals, giant clams. Pero hindi to fishermen, uh, they were supported by the Chinese Coast Guard. So, ibig sabihin, may uh, support of the state. And then the judges said that China's large-scale land reclamation and building of artificial islands aggravated the dispute resolution proceeding. It's like tampering with the evidence. So nagalit ang judges dito. Sinabi nila, China permanently destroyed evidence in the South China Sea. Uh, the... The award is 500, the decision is 500 pages, but at the last few pages, they summarize it. So what, is, what does this all mean? No? What, does it, what is the impact? Nawala na yung cobwebs of doubt on the nature of the features in the South China Sea and what belong to the EEZ of the Philippines. Uh, there's been a lot of misunderstanding because tinatanong, so hindi naman pala sinabi ng tribunal na atin ito because the permanent the international tribunal is uh, no but china china has excluded itself from any litigation on ownership issues 
So they took out themselves, parang were excluded from this provision. So ang pwede lang na gawin ng tribunal was to decide ano yung entitlements ng mga features. So nawala, the, the ruling shrunk the disputed area to a smaller size. Ang sabi ni Justice Carpe, not more than 1.5% of the 3.5 million square kilometers of maritime space in the South China Sea. So maliit na lang yung uh, contested area. So imagine that uh, a small country like ours with a very weak military, we won in international court and we had a case built on history and by the law of the sea, which 167 states signed, uh, signed, signed up for and agreed with. China was one of the signatories to UNCLOS, but it chose to stay outside it and continues to say that they have indisputable sovereignty over the South China Sea. That's why our victory is both sweet and bitter. But in reality, if we look back, it was China that forced the Philippines to seek a third party arbitration because after two decades of dialogues, consultations, nagka dead end tayo, so the Philippines had to look for another way. And maybe just to refresh our memories, I'd like to give you a short timeline no, of the skirmishes with China in the South China Sea. 1988, uh, this was not really much, much reported on because at the time, I couldn't find in the internet, at the time, uh, we were not very much aware of the activities of China. They occupied uh, several reefs and now these have all turned into uh, military installations and bases. 1995 is what I remember because I was already a reporter and the Philippines was shocked at the time at that si President Ramos was our president and one fine day, China grabbed Mischief Reef, pala, Panganiban Reef. And we only found out that they grabbed it because there were fishermen who reported it. Our military, for some reason, baka mahina ang radar, mahina ang intel, hindi nakuha. And then, today, it's a military base complete with underground storage for ammunition. In my book, I, dev I devote an entire chapter to Mischief Reef because it's so interesting that we had to learn it from the fishermen who went to the uh, military to complain that they were detained. And then the military sent uh, patrols and they found out that there na palang structures ang China. So nag protest ang Philippines. Sabi ng China, no, these are, these are civilian structures uh, meant to uh, give safety to our fishermen. But our military found out may mga antenna, parabola, parang military structures na. So they were disproven. The Chinese were proven pala to be uh, lying. And then more recent, 2004-2005, if you remember, under the time of President Arroyo, the Philippines entered into an agreement with China to fish, I mean, to ex explore rather for oil and gas in Rectobank. Ito yung naging controversial na JMSU, Joint Marine Seismic Undertaking. So, Philippines, Beijing, and Manila agreed to do this. Nagkar ng signing sa Beijing, nagalit ang Vietnam because Vietnam said, "You have the Philippines ran to ASEAN when." Mischief Reef was grabbed. Ngayon, you, you discount ASEAN and you just do a joint deal. So uh, the Philippines and China appeased Vietnam, naging tripartite deal. So China used its ship to collect the data, and Vietnam supposedly processed the data, and the Philippines supposedly interpreted the data. Natapos na yung survey, but none of the results have been made public kasi daw confidential. And a case questioning the JMSU's constitutionality is still pending in the Supreme Court. It was filed 10 years ago. Guess kung sino ang justice in charge dito sa JMSU. Sino ang ponente? The new Chief Justice, Lucas Bersamin, your favorite Ali. <laughs> so bakit hindi pa niya, why didn't he work on it? And the Philippines needs this guidance at this time. 
Because why do we need it at this time? Remember, President Xi Jinping was in the Philippines in November and Manila and Beijing signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Oil and Gas Exploration. But it's very, very interesting that if you read the MOU, the Chinese draft, which we were able to get a copy of, wanted to start already oil and gas exploration. Let's, let's start. Pero pinalitan ng Philippines under Loxin, under fortunately napalitan si Cayetano. Pinalitan ni Loxin yung, at and his legal team yung provisions ng MOU saying, in other words, saying, no, no, let's, let's not start. Let's agree to negotiate. So we will have 12 months to arrive at the terms. So na set back ngayon ang China and wala na silang nagawa kasi last minute maneuvering na ito ng DFA. And what's interesting is that pinasok ng DFA sa MOU kasi sabi ng China, the China authorizes Chinese na say CNOOC, China National Oil Offshore Corporation to 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 author, authorizes them to explore. Sabi ng Philippines, dun sa Chinese draft, the Philippines authorizes blank. So dapat Philippines will fill it up. Philippines changed it. DFA said, the Philippines will authorize companies with service contracts to explore for oil and gas. What is a service contract? Ito yung routine contracts na in issue ng energy department to companies saying that the state owns the resources in the area and the companies should follow Philippine laws. So yun ang nilagay ng DFA. So which changes the whole tone of the MOU, which means if the Chinese agree to that, they will have to uh, acknowledge Philippine sovereign rights over Rectobank, which I think they'll never do. So let's see. Babantayan natin ngayon si Secretary Loxin and how he will uh, manu he and the DFA will maneuver. So that's a very interesting development. And then in 2011, nga yung sinabi ko, this was when China stopped the Philippines for exploring for oil and gas in Reed Bank. I think more than a week to go na lang, tinigil sila na takot, na intimidate yung uh, company, yung service, na may service contract with the Philippines. And the famous Scarborough Shoal standoff, more than three, three and a half months, na pinatigil yung Filipino fishermen from fishing in the area. And ito yung 2013, 2014, habang our case already was in the, the tribunal, China attempted to prevent Philippine ships from delivering supplies to Second Thomas Shoal or Ayungin Shoal. This is the area where may ship na grounded, yun ang nagbabantay sa Ayungin Shoal. Kasi the ship, whatever condition it is, kahit bulok-bulok na, rusty, naglilik, it still represents the Philippines. It's still a registered in the registry of Philippine ships. So ito naman, here's a little known fact. Six fishermen helped us win the case. Four of them from Masinloc, a coastal town in Zambales, which is on the front lines of this tension because from Masinloc, you can see already Scarborough Shoal. The other two were from uh, Infanta. Ito yung four na galing Masinloc and I was able to meet them. Sila yung naka-experience firsthand talaga nung the Chinese when they stopped them from fishing. Yung they were, uh, he knows sila, we know their host sila or tinigil sila. And the testimonies of these four people, uh, they were in Tagalog, Filipino, translate into English, pinadala sa tribunal, and they helped win the case for the Philippines. So I'm really very proud of this, na nahanap ng Philippine government itong mga fishermen. And sinasabi nila, nung I interviewed them, sabi nila, akala namin, secret namin ang Scarborough Shoal. E ngayon, sikat na ang Scarborough Shoal. So ang dami na daw pumupunta, dumadayo to fish. And uh, when I interviewed them after the ruling na nanalo na tayo, pinayagan na silang bumalik, pero sa Scarborough Shoal kasi may lagoon inside. Hindi sila pinayagan inside, sa labas lang sila. So, sabi nila, bakit ganon? In the past, 
nanalo na nga tayo ngayon, dapat nakakapasok tayo, pero hindi pa rin. So China has control pa rin, but they are allowed to fish outside. So, um, naging strong point ng Philippine case, yung environmental aspect pala of the case, because it was proven that the Chinese fishermen routinely used uh, dynamite and cyanide fishing. Maraming evidence based on experts, expert witnesses. Grabe pala yung kanilang uh, the Chinese demand for live fish, which they use, they sell pala for aquarium trade and uh, they sell to restaurants. And it was also found out that China dredged coral reefs. Dami nilang sinira to build artificial islands. So this became a strong point of the case and the tribunal devoted a long section of the decision to this part. So ngayon, uh, what lessons can we learn from international cases wherein one of the states is not a participant, like the offending state? Hindi lang pala first ito that, Philipp that China refused to participate in the case. Uh, Nicaragua filed a case against the U.S. because the U.S. was supporting the contrast to dislodge the rulers of Nicaragua. They went to the International Court of Justice. Nicaragua won. And guess who is lawyer of Nicaragua? Paul Reichler, the lawyer of the Philippines. Si Paul Reichler pala, defender of the underdog. So when you review pala his cases, he defended Nicaragua, Maldives against UK, Bangladesh against India, so he's an activist in the, in the area of international law for smaller nations. So it was a right choice pala to have hired him. So at that time, the U.S. was funding the Contra rebels who, who wanted to topple the Sandinista-led government. So when the case filed by Nicaragua reached the merits phase, the U.S. declined to participate. They backed out. But the ICJ ruled against the U.S. and ordered the U.S. to pay reparations to Nicaragua. The U.S., of course, ignored uh, this decision and, uh, con and even with continuous requests from Nicaragua, refused to pay tiyatawag na reparations. You know what Nicaragua did? And I just found out recently, <clears throat> the Philippines pala, and if, if the decision came out under the time of Pinoy, the DFA pala wanted to do the same. So here's what Nicaragua did. They went to the UN Security Council to seek a resolution to urge the US to comply with the World Court's decision. But since uh, US was in the Security Council, na they failed. They failed to get a support of the Security Council. So failing that, the Nicaragua went to the UN General Assembly not once, three times. And here they succeeded. The General Four times pala, the General As Assembly adopted four resolutions calling the U.S. to fully and immediately comply with the judgment of the International Court of Justice. So because of this pressure, the U.S. paid Nicaragua, but they refused to call it reparations. They called it aid. So kahit na, di ba, kahit na binago mo yung name, nagbayad ka, pero hindi yung full amount. But still, in, this is being pointed out that the litigation was not useless, but you need to follow up. So sabi nitong mga academics who've been following this core, uh, these cases, na eventually with international pressure, you can, you can uh, not for, or persuade the offending country to comply with the ruling. Netherlands versus Russia. Netherlands sued Russia because Russia detained a ship with a flying the Netherlands flag, which was in the, it's called the Arctic Sunrise case. So ngayon, Russia, in 2013, Russia seized the ship, which was flying the Dutch flag, and its crew of Greenpeace activists. So the it laws asked Russia to immediately release the ship and allow the non-Russian crew members to leave the country. So at first, ayo ng Russia, but eventually they complied. You know why? They said that yes, we are uh, releasing the the ship and the crew, 
following our own domestic legislation, not the ITLOS ruling. So face saving, they did their, they had a, a domestic ruling, they followed it, and, and, and they said we are not following the ITLOS decision. So na release yung crew, kaya lang hindi pa nagbabayad ng compensation ang Netherlands to Russia. So uh, you don't get maybe the full compliance, but um, you get parts of it. Uh, partial compliance by the offending country. So I'd like to go back to Judge Paulak when he was in Manila just a few weeks ago. I hope this is clear enough, but he gave us wise advice. So, um, sabi niya kasi, it's not, in other words, he's saying it's not useless. Um, I'll just read from here kasi, layo. Okay. Sabi niya, I just like to quote a part, a part of this. The best way to solve the existing problems peacefully in the South China Sea is to negotiate on the basis of UNCLOS and international law. So the, the arbitral tribunals, clarification of crucial legal issues which divide the parties could be very helpful in such endeavor. So he was advising the Philippines and China, of course, but I don't know if they would listen, to use the award as a tool for negotiation. He said it would not be easy, and, only, and certainly it would take long, but there is no other way. So kasi, uh, there has been kasi some rhetoric that, starting from President Duterte, who said we're helpless, we can't. We can't enforce the ruling, but there are nuances, and this can be through negotiations with China. So I'd like to end, conclude with this uh, slide. This is not a six-year thing. This is not a, uh, just for the incoming administration, but making the tribunal ruling work is an intergenerational struggle. Matagal to, uh, and it will, it will require strategic thinking on the part of government and also the academe and a strong sense of justice, equity, and sovereign rights. So uh, with that, I think, I, I hope that uh, the, this is not just for the short term, but the victory that the Philippines um, garnered from our 2016 case called the Philippines versus China will benefit us all in the long term. Thank you. Yung tri arbitral tribunal is formed only when there is a request, there is a case filed. So ad hoc yan eh. So they choose five judges. Ganyan. Ngayon, since wala tayong experts pala sa Philippines uh, who, can, who have experience arguing the case before international courts on the law of the sea, so the Philippines uh, scanned the landscape. They, uh, they went to your DFA sent one of our diplomats to London and looked for European law firms. DFA sent another diplomat to the US to scan the environment also. They found out na maliit lang pala tong circle, as I said earlier. Siguro a hundred or so lawyers who have argued before international tribunal on the law of the sea, arbitral court tribunals, uh, and pa yung isa? I think World Court, International Court of Justice, kokonti lang pala sila. And those who specialize in law of the sea, yun nga, about a hundred something. So, Gilbert Asuke, who was then uh, a senior staff in the DFA, was sent to Europe. He, he interviewed six law firms, five or six. Three of them couldn't, defend, couldn't uh, say yes to the Philippines because their client is China. One of their clients is China. 
three or four. So nagulat siya sa niya, wow, ang, ang powerful ng China. The other one daw, hindi ganun ka up to par. And the other one had to consult also a client daw na baka sensitive. So out na yung, yung six sa Europe. Henry Bensurto, who was a maritime uh, love the sea expert ng DFA, was sent to the U.S. Yon nakascan din siya. They ended up with two law firms, two American law firms. Foley Hogue, ito yung napili ng Philippines. I forgot the other one, uh, White and Case pala. But they found that through the interviews, mas may experience pala ang Foley Hogue sa Law of the Sea. Because they reviewed Foley Hogue's record, that's when... Right, Claire defended Nicaragua, but he defended Nicaragua even before he joined Folihog. So Nicaragua, Maldives, uh, small countries pa in Latin America. So na interview siya, sa, na interviewed the Foreign Affairs Secretary Del Rosario, the ambassador to the U.S. at the time, para it was easy to make a decision. So unfortunately, wala tayong Philippine experts, and I think that's where learning from this case. I think the DFA has to send its has to make uh, develop a core of experts on law of the sea because after all we're a maritime country we have one of the longest coastlines in the world we're top 10 I think we're number 5 Canada has the longest and then US Japan so it's surprising that the Philippines has no uh, core of experts on law of the sea na doon lang sana nakatutok in Vietnam, I found out their Ministry of Foreign Affairs has six PhDs in law of the seas. Um, they are focusing on this because, as you know, Vietnam is a claimant and they have, uh, they're fighting this as well, but not yet legally. So, ganon. So, I hope one of the lessons nga is for strategic thinking on this issue and DFA should start already. Maybe, I don't know, scholarships, start training. This is a long battle. And also, UP has started already its own. Yung, meron silang yung KJ Batong Bakal, yung Maritime Institute or something. So, but uh, we need more expertise on this. Yeah. So, so ano naging papel ng mga Filipino lawyers? Ah, ito. Ang solicit, ganito, the, the foreign lawyers have to work with the Philippine government. So they are representing the Philippine government. They have to coordinate with the Solicitor General. And in other countries, I reviewed the part, the cases, the lawyers work with either the Attorney General, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or both, or whoever is assigned by the Prime Minister or the President. So in the Philippine case, the Solicitor General became the agent. Siya ang nagdi-deal with the lawyers, and for all official communications, uh, the lawyers deal with the agent. The agent, ideally, if the agent is an expert on the field, malaki ang contribution sa content and strategy. Kung hindi, they will provide research required by the lawyers. And there's an exchange of ideas. So ganun yung role. Pero dun sa pag argue hindi prepared ang... We don't have the expertise. So, naging uh, support, support, what they, yeah. The Philippines was a support, the Philippine soldier ang nag support sa uh, foreign lawyers. Pero walang private lawyers dito. Wala tayong Philippine private lawyers. It was the Solicitor General's office. Uh, just to be devil's advocate, I guess. Sometimes when I'm looking at what's going on, I'm trying to think, is it possible to interpret that the ability of President Duterte to stand tall and negotiate with Xi Jinping and that Xi Jinping actually listens to him, isn't that precisely because we have already won the case? I mean, what I'm trying to understand is, um, so I'm trying to get it out of the politics of, uh, you know, the Aquino versus the Duterte. Mm -hmm. All I'm trying to say is, uh, 
he is, well, Duterte is Duterte, I guess. So that's probably, and you know, his style might be different. And he keeps saying that. But I'm, I'm trying to say, hindi kaya mas ano din siya, mas matapang siyang manghingi. Although he keeps saying all these other things on the side. But he's able to, he's able to say, eh kung ganito ang kailangan namin, at ganito ang gusto namin, at ganyan ang gusto namin, at ganito, nakikinig yung China dahil alam nila, nanalo na tayo. So there has already been some, like he said, this case, has set the tone. Mm -hmm. And that tone is that we can stand up. Yes. We can say, this is ours. We want this. We want that. If you want us not to make noise, let us say that's the other strategy. I don't want to make noise. Try to give us this, this, and that. And uh, I'm trying to think of it <coughs> that way because uh, yung panlabas kasi na diplomacy, kuminsan, ano din yan? Style, hindi ba? Style lang. So the point is really to understand is the move in the Philippine interest as in the Philippines? So like that, getting our fishermen to fish, mm -hmm. can, we, can we therefore go ahead and uh, do this and do that? So is it possible? That's really my question. Is it possible to think of it that Duterte is actually using the fact that we had already won, even if, I don't know what other mm -hmm. people want to do to pursue it kasi. Kasi if you're looking at that other side, it's like, do I have to go to war? Parati kung sinasabi, di naman yata ganun gusto natin gawin eh. Gusto lang natin gawin is, uh, you recognize it's mm. ours and that if we want to do with it as we please you, we have first yes. first option. Is yes. it possible to think of it that way? Uh, wait, it's a difficult question. But the, 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 the gain of the Duterte administration in developing friendly ties with China is to be, is, uh, China allowed Actually, they shouldn't allow. They sh it's ours. <laughs> but, they, but they let the fishermen back. Oh, that was again uh, in Scarborough Shoal. But remember, when President Duterte criticized China, it was rare, maybe twice, he said, China, temper your behavior in the South China Sea because China stopped, this was under Duterte, China stopped Philippine soldiers from resupplying the shoal. Uh, Ayungin Shoal, this was recent. And then China answered, that uh, uh, rebuffed Duterte. So I was, I was surprised. So China will never recognize our, well, so far, hasn't recognized the victory. And before uh, the strategy of the DFA, supposedly, this was uh, when Duterte as assigned a new ambassador to China, was to do a parallel uh, discussion Ambassador Santa Romana said, who's in Beijing, the Philippines will discuss economics, tourism, investments on a separate track, and we will uh, separate the South China Sea issue. But the second track has not yet happened. So, yeah, it's a difficult thing, but my question also is this. How can Vietnam do it? How can China be the top trading partner of Vietnam? But when China just installed weather stations in the South China Sea, Vietnam protested. It was an angry note verbal. Yet China is their top trading partner. So my question is, I was asking some diplomats, and they were saying they have a long history with China. They defeated China and you know, all that. And also it's a communist party. They can talk maybe, I don't know, they can talk party to party. But why, are, why do they have a different approach which we cannot do? So that's, which maybe, Ali, you can study. <laughs> no, academics can study because I've been fascinated by that response. Because remember, uh, China's ministry, of foreign, uh, minist foreign ministry announced Chinese, China's uh, installed weather stations in this and that. And then next story, Vietnam protested. And then the Philippine reporters asked, Panelo ba? Ah, no. Ask Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Loxin. Nagalit si Foreign Affairs Secretary kasi sabi ng reporters, have you already verified the presence of the weather stations and are you going to protest? Sabi ni Secretary Loxin, that's your job. You should verify it. You know, when I was in a reporter, we verified if there was really... So nag nagalit siya sa mga reporters. <laughs> so ngayon pala, Job na po na ng reporters mag-verify kung may radar stations. <laughs> no, so it's just uh, an interesting story. As often when you hear pronouncements of the president, 
and not making capital of that uh, ruling. And sometimes you feel discouraged. But uh, listening to you, uh, this is a landmark case. And no matter what Duterte says, the case and the ruling stands. Correct. Uh, <clears throat> will it be true that we will just wait for another regime to be able to make a stronger case on our claims? I think so. Whoever, if the new regime is open to this, uh, to pressuring China or is open to a new uh, arrangement with China, and as long as the Philippines does not waive the decision, now I, I, I wasn't aware of the legal ramifications when the president said, I will set aside this ruling in, in the early months. I will set it aside. And then uh, Justice Carpio in a talk said, in the legal parlance, setting aside means waiving it. So he asked the DFA to clarify. So the FA issued a statement said, no, the Philippines is not waiving it, and they explained what it meant. So ganun pala yon. Uh, just the, uh, as long as the Philippines recognizes the ruling, then it will not atrophy. So it's just there. But uh, of course, it has to be used to the Philippine advantage. Yeah. Uh, Follow-up question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can the president unilaterally waive such a ruling, or it has to have a concurrence of ah. the Senate and the oh, Congress no. and the Supreme Court? Uh, it's not a treaty, so I think he can unilaterally. That's, I'm not a lawyer, but it's not a treaty. Uh, it's a, just a case. So that's why I think when he said set aside, Justice Carpio asked the DFA to clarify, So and then they did. So. He, I think he can unilaterally do that. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's it's a, diba? It's not a treaty because there's a case pending in the Supreme Court about when he unilaterally withdrew from the International Rome Statute (ICC). So, eh, may debate pa, eh, dapat pala with the approval of the Senate. Pero tatanungin ko yun, sir. Tatanungin ko nga if, if pwedeng unilateral. Um, <clears throat> curious lang po ako. Because um, for me, the sovereignty of the Philippines is always something we want to uh, keep in our hearts. Uh, it's our identity. It's our uh, right, right? Um, and then recently, si uh, former ombudsman... Conchita Morales Carpio or <clears throat> mentioned the word which was for me very, very strong. Mm -hmm. The stance of the president is equivalent to treason. Mm -hmm. And for me that was a heavy, strong, but also a signal for us to put our acts together. Um, but again, siyempre yung, ano yung implications nun? So mm -hmm. siguro yun yung tanong ko, from your perspective as one who did a very thorough study on this uh, research. I read that quote of Justice Conchita Carpe Morales. Uh, he was quoting a Roman <laughs> statesman. Sino ba yun? And it, did, it, was so, it was vaguely in reference to, he didn't, I know, vaguely in reference to Duterte. So it wasn't a direct... Because I read, I said, wow, this is... Uh, sabi niya, treason. Then I read the entire quote. She was quoting pala. Ar Cicero ba to? I forgot. But so, oh, she was quoting this. Parang the context was warning. Parang warning the Philippine government. So, uh, I don't know. Treason is a very... Nga, very it's a difficult... Uh, a thing to prove and it can be a part of an impeachment case like in the US but they're thinking treason because of Trump's uh, deals with Russia so tayo ba may case ba tayo mukhang wala naman uh, it's, it's very well I have to ask the lawyers again <laughs> but para at this stage what can we what is uh, evidence to show that there is treason 
just by not acting on the decision, because uh, Duterte kept, keeps saying, uh, it's not the right time to bring it up, ganyan siya, it's not the right time, but it's there. So wala naman siyang sinasabing, yun nga, if waving it, unilaterally waving it, baka yun, there's, if uh, there's a concrete move which uh, waves the decision, then that can be a ground, I, I assume, for treason. Yeah. Uh, but again, the, I will have to consult the experts. Good morning. Uh, morning. I'm Art Bukirin, uh, Arthur. No? So mm -hmm. I'm trying to respond to the question whether Duterte can uh, unilaterally waive mm -hmm. Philippine rights. No? So my opinion is this. Uh, Duterte cannot permanently waive Philippine rights uh, mm -hmm. in favor of China, the, uh, our rights to the... West Philippine Sea because yung award, yung award, uh, yung uh, July 12, 2016, 2016 award was merely a response sa mga, sa mga legal questions ng, uh, ng uh, Pilipinas. Okay. No? Uh, halimbawa, isa sa mga question doon, may right ba ang China mm -hmm. doon sa, sa mm -hmm. yung kanilang nine-dash line? And the, ang, 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 ang pag-award was based on the UN clause. No? Yes. Yung UN clause, hindi, ma, hindi okay, yun yes. ma-wave ng yes, Pilipinas. Yes. Unless no? we, would, we withdraw. Like uh, what? Kahit na, it will stand as an, as an, as an inter, okay. uh, international law. It is, yes. Kasi dati, di ba, yung uh, law of the sea, ang, ang coverage lang, yung, I think, three, three miles, ano? three miles, yung range ng canon, no? from the coastline, yung range ng canon from the coastline, three miles lang yun three nautical miles. And yun lang na nagko-constitute ng uh, territory ng, uh, ng isang bansa. Pero under the own clause, binago yun. I think, uh, 15, 15 ba yun? And then the 200. Two, no, no. The, ah, for the... Ex, ano yun? Exclusive economic yes. zone. So, yun yung magiging ano. Uh, that cannot be waived. Nagko-constitute na yun ng international law. But temporarily, hindi naman talaga ma-wave magkakaroon ng justification yung China to entrench mm -hmm. itself sa, sa West Philippine Sea. And that can be a problem because yung mga Western nations naman will either refer to the old, uh, ano yun, old uh, uh, law of the sea, yung three miles lang ang territory and therefore yung, yung, yung territorial sea, and therefore pwede silang magano doon, magpasyal-pasyal uh, doon sa... <laughs> dun sa mm -hmm. Uh, kiniklaim ng China ng nine dash line and or, or pwede rin naman hindi nila recognize yung yung ano no yung mga hindi member ng UNCLOS pwede ng ano pwede silang talagang pumunta ron no and i think that will be more uh, problematic no mm -hmm. so sticking dun sa UNCLOS will be will be more peace promotive rather yes, than yes. Uh, uh, yung yung ano yung ginagawa ngayon ni Duterte mm -hmm. thank, thank you, you very much. for the clarification Ano ang response ng ASEAN? Hindi unified ang ASEAN. But, uh, kasi claimants, Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, apat yun eh, Vietnam. <clears throat> so we're not united because Laos, Cambodia, and the other uh, have are very close to China. So walang common position on the arbitral tribunal. Kaya nagkag nagkaroon ng tension in the one of the early ASEAN meetings after July 2016, when Vietnam was trying to insert and the Philippines. No, it was Vietnam pala. The Philippines wasn't even doing it to insert the arbitral tribunal ruling. Kasi sabi ni Kayatano, he didn't want it inserted. Kasi atin lang naman do case yun. But anyway, so wala tayong common stand. But ASEAN is active in the conduct, the liberations uh, conduct on COC. Declaration of the conduct on, kalimutan ko na yun ah. Code of the conduct on South China Sea. Yun. Active ang ASEAN doon with China. The thing is, it's been taking years. So, sabi ng China and ASEAN, two years to go na lang. Meron na kasing single uh, draft. Meron ng isang draft na. They will start from this single draft. 
So let's see how it works. Pero in the meantime na pinag-uusapan yung code of conduct, eh nandyan na ang China sa maraming reefs. That's one. So mahirap ang ASEAN. Very tricky. Number two, nap napabuti ba na napalitan? You know, in a way dito sa... Yes, when it comes to this MOU, nagulat. I've been following, and our reporters, we've been following the MOU. We had the Chinese draft. We had the... Uh, and then we saw the DFA draft, and then we saw the final draft. Ibang-iba sa China. And then, di ba, nagbigay na interview si Loxin. Sabi niya, I wrote this. Pero syempre, kasama niya yung legal team. So it changed. It changed. <laughs> Medyo mayabang ang ating foreign secretary. <laughs> but, I mean, we were surprised that he was able to do that. E eh, kapapasok lang niya sa DFA. So ngayon, the challenge is, within the 12 months, masusustain ba yun? Baka mag magkaroon ng pressure. Because China, uh, the Global Times, which is the mouthpiece of the communist subsidiary ng People's Daily, which is the mouthpiece of the communist part of China, gumawa ng analysis after Foreign Minister Wang Yi came to Manila in October. Sabi niya, the Philippines and China will now have its first ground level. Parang inannounce na nila, this is the first chance they will have at uh, implementing first ground level exploration. It was very optimistic. And then November, dumating si Xi Jinping. Nako, yung mga reporters, nagahanap na nung draft. And then when Loxin turned up with the draft, iba. So, so far, yes, even if he's very acerbic, and if he's, even if he tweets all kinds of things, <laughs> so so far, let's see, will he be able to sustain it? But na surprise din ako kay Loxin that pumayag siyang wag na tayong nag magprotest against China on the radar. mga siguro he's also doing a balancing act.